not a con. I do tend to mumble, so if you can't hear me, don't hesitate to say, speak up. <laughs> um, welcome to History of U.S. Copyright. It, this is going to be a brief overall history, focusing more on where we were at the beginning of the country, coming up. Then I'm going to touch a little bit on Creative Commons. You know, I'm not going to go on about exciting stuff like how evil copyright is. It's going to be boring. So you're all forewarned. Uh, what is copyright? Well, basically, Title 17 of the U.S. Code provides protection for authors, creators of their original works. It's a limited form of a monopoly for a set period of time that's ever so gotten longer. That creator has complete total control. He can dis dictate how his creative work is used. Now I'm going to back up before the U.S kind of give a background of where everything came from. Back in 1662, there was the Licensing Act. Basically what that was, was to, the British Crown wanted to control everything that was printed. Authors really did not have rights to their own works. It was the printers who had the rights. And the Crown said, there are these registered books. These are the only things that can be printed. It was, cover it was monitored and controlled by the Stationers Company, which was basically an organization of printers and booksellers. They dictated through the from orders of the crown what was acceptable. After that lapsed in the 1690s, control, censorship loosened up and then came the 1710 Statute of Anne, which is very similar to what we know as copyright. It, it stated that for 14 years, the author of the work had the monopoly. He had total last say on what was done with his creative work. If he was still alive at the end of that 14 years, he could re-register for an additional 14. After that, anyone could do what they wanted with that work. Now, it wasn't really much of a copyright as we know today because if the author wanted to see financial gain from his work, he still had to go to these printers and booksellers who have always been used to having the last say on what was done with it. So, really their control was no more than just on paper and make them feel good. Then comes, of course, the founding of the country. When the U.S. Constitution was written, they decided they're going to put in, um, excuse me, they're going to put in the provision that says Congress gets to dictate copyright law. Also in the same single sentence they set up for patent law, which in the beginning of the country they were one and the same basically. Then at 1790 comes the Copyright Act, which is the very first U.S. copyright law. 
They built it off in the Statute of Anne from England, which is what they knew. Had the 14 years of re registered protection, then the additional 14 year extension, and it is the first time where a public domain is actually defined. As in, if the author is dead at the first 14 years, it's public domain. Anyone can do what they want. If it's registered for the additional 14, at that end, that's it. There's nothing else that they can do. It becomes the public's. Then, you know, for a while, things are fine. 1831 is the first general revision. What happens is Congress decides to extend the primary term to 28 years because it brings it more in line with what was happening in Europe. Plus everything that was already under copyright that has not expired automatically gets that 28 years plus the possibility of 14 year extension. I also believe at this time they allowed it that the family, like the widow or widower and children of the author could get that 14 year extension and still profit from the creative work. 1870 was the second general revision where prior to, to 1870 administration of copyright law so if you were to register your copyright was done in the local district courts they moved it from that to the Library of Congress side effect of that we saw copyright registration skyrocket until so by 1897 they actually had to appoint a register of copyrights which then later becomes the copyright office in 1909 the third general revision basically again it's extending the term now you see an additional 28 year extension plus all the new forms of media that have been out such as photographs um, different types of print are now covered you know they're they were covered before to an extent but they're now specifically covered as what they are I, I believe film was one of them where it was, no, that come, I think comes later, it's, never mind. <laughs> All right, now here, 1976, now, depending who you talk to, it's either the fourth general revision of U.S. copyright law or it is a total replacement of copyright law. A lot of things have changed. They address a lot of new, a lot of the new technological advances, such as motion pictures, which were always covered as photographs. They're now covered as motion picture. It also addresses new ways that things can be copied and what is copyrightable, what, you know, what constitutes a violation of copyright. Like I said who you talk to it's either a totally new replacement or just a revision but it does eliminate everything that was before is now re replaced by the 1976 copyright act protection jumps from 28 years plus 28 year extension to the life of the author plus 50 years after he dies. Plus, also, fair use is finally defined in copyright law. Prior to this, uh, there was fair use, 
but any time it was tested, you took your chances with the courts. Nineteen ninety two is a big deal. They amend section three oh four of Title seventeen, which is, covers the renewal. It now becomes automatic. So now automatically upon an author's death, his copyright is still good for fifty years. Prior to that it had to be registered. Now, 1998 is, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, known as the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. I guess Sonny was tired of screwing up Cher's life. He thought he'd get his hands in screwing up everyone else's. Protection jumps to 70 years after death. But the upside that no, most people don't talk about is it really doesn't change for things such as libraries, universities are doing research because that 20 year, last 20 years of a copyright, if you're using it for non-commercial, educational type uses, near a library, a university, some sort of research facility, consider it public domain. Do what you will. But it, got, it has to be non-commercial. All right, 1998 Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this because everybody probably knows more than I do. <laughs> Again, the big thing is there's new types of media, covers mostly internet related, digital formats. Big thing that everyone has the problem with is section. 1201, which prevents circumvention of any type of encryption or security measures on these new digital medias. People go to jail, you know, because they discover that ROT 13 encryption is, you know, been around since 1970 something. <laughs> and almost any Usenet news reader does it automatically for you. <laughs> um, now this brings me pretty much to my real point <laughs> of this. In 2001, a bunch of really smart guys get together, create Creative Commons. It's a licensing system, works inside of US copyright law because when you make something, it doesn't matter if it's published or not. You know, you draw a funny picture on a cocktail napkin. That's copyrighted. You can dictate how that's used till the day you die, and then your children can use it for another 70 years. Well, maybe you want people to use that cocktail napkin picture but you want to still be known as the creator of it. Well, with Creative Commons, you can set up a license that says, freely use this as long as you attribute it to me as my creation. What that, you can do that under normal copyright law in a sense by having a bunch of lawyers draft up all kinds of contracts and stuff but somebody has to come and bother you. Creative Commons, you do it, you set it free to the world. No one has to take the time and effort to get a hold of you and ask your permission. If they follow your guidelines that you set forth in your Creative Commons license. Um, I wish I knew a lot more about this, but they are changing so much, I can't keep up with it. 
and this guy over here is going to call me on anything I do say wrong about it. <laughs> um, you know, most of my stuff, I'm a printer by trade. That's where my copyright experience is at. I deal with print media. Uh, I don't really know very much about music other than I hate Top 40 radio. Um, a specific case here of Creative Commons licensing would be these things. It's a project we're running here at Nauticon. Basically, what it is is these are blank sketchbooks. And people are encouraged to write in them, draw in them, express themselves. And then at the end, what we are going to do is we're going to scan these all in all these images, all these writings, put them together into a PDF format that you could take anywhere, down to your local Kinko's, print yourself out a book, free of charge. Feel free to build off other people's ideas as long as you're not selling it commercially, using it for your own personal gain. It's part of what drives the guys behind Creative Commons is let's build on everyone's knowledge, that real sense of community that, that seems to get lost now by the big corporations. Um, Any questions? I know I ran through this stuff pretty fast. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but I will try my best to answer any questions anyone may have. Would you recommend as far as uh, finding Creative Commons content? I know there's a number of search engines geared towards certain types of content. Uh, I find the best thing to do is to go to creativecommons.org, their website. I mean, they have, you know, they that's part of something they do is a clearinghouse for it. Um, yeah, I. I don't Yeah, and I I've read a little bit about that prior to coming here. They, um, I guess it, it's kind of up in the air whether Yahoo is just ripping off someone else. No, well, all, all Yahoo is doing is, because um, we have Peter Commons also have our own search engine. Yes. Uh, search that's that's usually yeah. where you, I suggest starting. Right. Ours would be actually a crawl and we can already have this in there. But just, Yahoo's just using um, license and facts. So they're thinking of just being search database and tracing link back to some license views. And that fair, it's not a guaranteed indicator, but it's fairly fair indicator. So Didn't I see something recently about a way to embed Creative Commons license information into binary files, like say in image headers and stuff like that? Is, is that something these search engines would pick up on? Search engines would not pick up on the binary information. Right. They're going to just mine. They might, but yes, most search, most search engines, matter of fact, I think all search engines are only looking at text. They they don't even look inside flash files. Isn't that the whole idea, though, of the semantic web and RDF? Yes, our RDF is machine readable text. I mean, I guess. You can read it yourself, but it's pretty yeah, prettier it's to look at it through a uh, parser. Mm -hmm. Any questions on like copyright? Uh, more on Creative Commons? <laughs> feel like I've only used maybe five minutes of your time and I'm feeling really bad about this. <laughs>
Maybe you're expecting some awesome speech on the caliber of Lawrence Lessig, and I let you down. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where it's going. What kind of ideas have you heard of floating around to help promote the use of creative comments where appropriate for corporate interests, where they're usually more focused on what the other signs of their eyes wouldn't normally consider something like this? They have no reason not to. How, how, can we how can we encourage corporate America to use Creative Commons? Honestly, they're not going to for everything. The no. The American Association of America is not going to release a Creative Commons movie as a, a blockbuster movie on the CC. But no. They, and they might release their trailers on the CC or things like, or, or little things. Well, really, they. I deal with the, these guys on a daily basis in my work with corporate America, like the Disney's and MGM's, and they don't see any value of Creative Commons, really, because to them, once something is theirs, they don't want to give it up. They want to go way back to prior to 1662 when copyright was felt belonged to the corporation, i.e. the printers, way back then, and it lasted forever. They owned it, you know, till the end of time. That's what they, that's how they feel. As to them, any way of convincing them otherwise, it's going to be a very long, hard road to, for people to convince them. Uh, I guess the best way is for the little guy to be not depending so much on them, on the corporations to get their message out, which is one of the beautiful things of the internet, is now one guy alone in his den at home put up a website, share his self-made movie or his music, his books, whatever. And eventually what will have to happen is if everybody individually is releasing their stuff under create a Creative Commons type license, there is just the big companies are going to have to take notice and there because there isn't going to be enough media for them the way they work pretty much everything is work for hire which means they pay you you never created what you just created they did it belongs to them it always has it always will be Yes, but I would, I would, uh, I would speculate that the open source software movement probably had very similar hurdles, even though it started on the opposite end of the spectrum. So it had advantage there. It, it, it's, it still there's some definite parallels you can draw between battles you have to fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of commercial software companies aren't never going to see value of open source software. That doesn't mean they might not benefit from it sometime and might eventually think, oh, well, this isn't earning us any money directly and this could help a lot of people. So other people might improve this for us. We could release this and still keep this moneymaker of ours private. It, yeah, with the software companies, I can only think of one, two if you want to stretch it. Novell and IBM who are able to do that right now who are actually using open source. I don't know enough about software but that's I understand that. but um, though the hardcore open, open source uh, evangelists would probably take issues with the specifics of the licensing mm -hmm. we've gotten to a point where even Microsoft is releasing open source software and I think that says a lot of how far they've gone yeah and it will be hard, and there could be a day when 
Disney will decide, hey, <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. Well, I, I would, uh, it's interesting to draw the software analogy because I think that if you look at the way open source software is written for corporations, that before they started releasing things, they found value in consuming things. And so, you know, they found value in consuming them with the or high suit that it's based on the open. Yes. So I think that the you know, part of CC's mission is not just the license, but also to make it low as the action cost of licensing media and licensing works. And so I think that as corporations see value in consuming CC licenses, we can see how that lowers uh, this barrier to entry and this transaction cost. I think that may, in an analogous way, drive the adoption of CC licenses. Yeah, because right now, media companies are in the business really of producing content, not consuming it. One of the things, though, that is going for Creative Commons that open source really didn't have, like you said, a lot of the evangelists will argue over the license. You don't see so much of that. Matter of fact, hardly any at all, really. Pretty much people who are behind Creative Commons, behind 100% of the way. He's open source software. <laughs> but Stallman is pretty much against everything. <laughs> but. It will be it will be a very long hard road. Someday it may happen. What I think will it'll go is it'll, you'll see smaller companies that will adopt it first because and what need what they need is they have to first have see the value in consuming something. If a hundred people release on the internet under Creative Commons, short clips of their trip somewhere. And the company decides, I'm going to make a documentary on the trip to the Grand Canyon. They find all this work already there. They will love to have something for nothing. And as long as the license is compatible enough so that they can profit in some way, they will adopt it and use it. But big media companies are never going to give away something for free because their product is the creative work. Where a software company, they can give away the software, but they're selling the service. Yeah, I'm making a generalization. <laughs> Disney. Yes. Is, is Mickey Mouse copyrighted under this type of stuff? Like, is he going to expire? Um, not for a very long time. Did they get a special extension or something? That is a possibility. I'm not sure on the specific, but um, Mickey Mouse was to expire and then came the Copyright Extension Act, and there's a bunch of other things such as because Disney's considered a work or Mickey Mouse is considered a work for hire which actually has a longer I believe oh, I it just it escapes me right now I want to say nine no it's not 95 years it's corporate oh, corporate authors have it longer um, yes kind of like about it, I guess, but they keep it risk, they keep it to expire in the 76. Right? And you expect to expire in 99. Yeah. Yeah, because what it did is. Yeah, it's. And there, are, there has been cases in the past where. 
specific publishers or companies have actually gotten Congress to pass a special private extension for their copyright. Um, I didn't uh, really go into any of that because I, I was just trying to cover a generalization of copyright law. Just was kind of trying to do a setup for Creative Commons stuff just so that people knew why Creative Commons is something that is needed now. Mm -hmm. and of course there are all these stocks they're like yes, Um, yeah, and I think that's probably where you'll start to see it happen more is they will start to license stuff where you can I mean, it's kind of already built into copyright where under fair use where certain non-commercial uses of images and sounds, movies are acceptable. But as soon as you try to profit off it, it's no longer fair use. Yeah. Yeah, we I run into that quite regular in my day job where we will actually get get an order from a university or a nonprofit organization that's ran through a university, they can't even use their own university logo because they don't have the proper permission and they can't get the permission because there's that area where, well, this is copyrighted, we can't use it for anything but what some guy or lawyer is saying. And that's where it gets fuzzy. As far as like those stock photo places, I've been to them. It can, licensing fees can get outrageous really quick. That's where Creative Commons would be really good. That's one of the things if you visit their website, they actually talk about is and right now Creative Commons biggest problem is, is getting the word out that it's there getting people to use it it's part of why I came up with this sketchbook project idea you know it lets people <laughs> use it let people see that it's not a bad thing. It's it's great to share information, ideas. And it's kind of a funny thing. You can't copyright an idea. But at the same time, with the way copyright law is written in the US right now, that's what's happening, really, is you're locking up ideas. 
because it's really the representation of the idea. Now, I can sit here and say copyright is bad. And, well, anyone can take that and use it because that's an idea, a thought. But if I write it on the board and you take a pic and take a picture of it, well, you can't use that picture. Period. I just locked up that idea, so to speak. Any comments? How poorly I'm doing? Ha, 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 you guys, let me ask you.